The stronger healing anointing in my ministry is through prayer calls. That's just proven out over the, over the ministry. You just can't, you know, you, you begin to evaluate and begin to go, well, boom, 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 over the years. Now, now Brother Benny has a different healing anointing. Brother Benny, just he'll get in there like you know, with tenacity and just get him healed. Hallelujah. Amen. So, you, you know, different anointings manifest differently. You just you work within, you work within what's there. Silver and gold have a none, but such as I have, give I thee. Amen? Not, not one is better than the other. Uh, if you go into a meeting and they get healed because they laid hands on you right in that meeting, that's not better than getting a prayer cloth. You don't, what's better? They got healed. We don't care how. We just care that they did. Amen? And when I say we don't care how, we don't, we're not concerned about how God used what vessel to get the job done. What we're concerned is the job got done. <clears throat> People got ministered to. They came in contact with the mercies of God. And he gets all the glory and the honor and the praise. Amen? Because without the anointing, we're nothing. Hallelujah. Without his presence, without his power, we are nothing. Glory to God. But with him, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen. Hallelujah. Any, so any more prayer calls before we get started? Hallelujah. All right. Glory to God. Let's go ahead. We're going to jump into a, a couple of uh, places here tonight. Uh, one I wanted to get into. We covered a couple weeks ago in a service, but I, I, I do believe it's, it's good uh, to cover this one um, again, if I can find her, hallelujah, glory to God. Look with me, if you will, over into the um, 13th chapter of the book of Luke, 13th chapter of the book of Luke, hallelujah. I want to cover this one, the, the crippled woman in the synagogue, and then I want to cover the Syrophoenician woman, because they are the two opposites. There are two opposite spectrums on, in, in healing being administered in the body of Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. So looking here in Luke, the 13th chapter, we'll start in the 10th verse. And it says here, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Hallelujah. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity. Now, um, Phillips writes it had some psychological or physiological cause but she had a spirit of infirmity eight how long? 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself when Jesus saw her he called unto him and said woman thou art loosed from thine infirmity and he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight, and what did she do? Glorified God. Didn't say she started going, oh, you're great, you're wonderful, oh, you know, uh, I'm going to give a new car to your ministry. She glorified God. Hallelujah. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with what? Indignation. We got those same guys running around today. People go and get go into a, a service where there people lay hands on the sick or uh, and ministering that way, and they'll get all mad. They'll take out ads in the paper that they're a false, they're, they're a cult. They'll they'll get the police to go get. They, back in the fifties, when the healing revival was going on, they would actually come out and charge ministers with practicing medicine without a license. People were getting healed. Miracles were taking place. I mean, supernatural signs and wonders, and they just got mad because it messed up their, their doctrine. They were more concerned about their doctrine than they were helping people. That's the wrong spirit. I said, that's the wrong spirit. When your doctrine's wrong, especially, you know, he don't heal anymore. You know, it's amazing how many people believe that God now is the one who inflicts people, and if anybody's ministering and getting them well, it's Satan who's doing the ministry. It's amazing. And the rule of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. They messed with their um, rituals and practices. And I'm trying to think of the other word. It just abated me. Abated me. Um, what is it when you do something over and over again? It's the same thing you do all the time. Traditions. Thank you. <laughs> Remember, Jesus told one guy, he said, you've made the word of God of none effect through the traditions of men. Okay, thank you for that help, Belinda. He said, listen to this. 
the woman, this woman's been in their, their synagogue 18 years. Jesus walks in one day, says, you're loose from your infirmity. She stands up straight, and what has he got to say? There are six days in which to heal. Let him come on those days and get healed, not on the Sabbath. Well, she showed up for 18 years on the Sabbath with you, pal, and didn't get anything. Isn't that right? There are six days in which men ought to work, in them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath. Well, what did you do for those six days a week for 18 years, buddy? Hello? He came in on the Sabbath and got her healed, you know, right in there. He just went into one of the synagogues, saw her there, laid hands on her, got her healed, and now he's mad. Because right, he got showed up, probably. That went over big. And Jesus just looked at him and just said, oh, bless your darling heart. Is that what he said? No, Jesus answered him and said, you hypocrite. You hypocrite. Do you not teach? Uh, do not, uh, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and take him to watering? And ought not this woman be a daughter of Abraham? Now, here's what we're after in this particular one. Covenant woman. She's a daughter of Abraham. She has a covenant right to what she just received. Amen. That's why Jesus said that. Ought not this woman be a daughter of Abraham? The significance is that, there was, that they, they serve Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. It is the compound covenant name of God Almighty was Jehovah Rapha. They had a covenant of health and healing. And so Jesus said, you hypocrite, this woman has a covenant right to Jehovah Rapha. Amen. Listen to who he said this, whom Satan has bound. Now who did the binding? Satan. Who did the loosing? Jesus. Be loose from her infirmity on the Sabbath day. Whom Satan has bound these 18 years. Woman's been bound 18 years and the guy's mad she got healed on the Sabbath. What devil do you think that is? It's a religious devil operating through that guy. He'd rather see her go out of there bound because it was the Sabbath and messed with their tradition. Then you see her go out free. Amen. And since when could we not? And listen, if he got up and read, read the synagogue, he was working on the Sabbath. Wasn't he? He traveled to the synagogue to, to read from the, to, the scrolls. He traveled from the synagogue to, to teach the word of God to the people. He was working on the Sabbath. But something supernatural took place. woman got well, and he got mad. <clears throat> and Jesus said it's hypocritical to deny someone what they have a covenant right to just because of your tradition. Amen. Hallelujah. You, remember, you go back and listen to Dad Hagen talk about how he got filled with the Holy Ghost. He went over to the house of the pastor. They had a guest speaker. And he went over to the house of the pastor and said, you know, I, I want to I get filled with the Holy Ghost. They said, well, look, we're going to have the service tonight. The service starts about an hour and a half. Uh, let's just, you know, wait, come on down to the altar. See, they, they're all their tradition. We just got to go down to the altar and tarry. He said, no, I'm ready to see right now. And the, and the guest minister kind of nudged the pastor and, and, and said, let's go ahead. Hey, no longer he, they sat, got, he got down on his knees. They brushed his head. He was speaking in tongues. Messed up their tradition. He didn't tarry. Now, I grew up in a tarrying church. And if you grew up classical Pentecostal, you know what I'm talking about. Listen, we, we made an institution out of Terry, and it wasn't birthed that way. You go back and study the history of the Pentecostal churches, they weren't birthed in what traditions we've created. They were birthed in the fire. They were birthed in the power of the Holy Ghost. They were birthed in people getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. I'm telling you, I mean, it was just, just people. I mean, Azusa Street, um, many of the mainline Pentecostal denominations came out of that move. And they came from all over the world for three years to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Three services a day, uh, every day for three, for three years. They were getting filled with the Holy Ghost, the power of God. And as those, we, we got to where we had to tarry. And the people get, come up with such things as, well, you know, I've been tarrying for five years, but I'll appreciate it more if I tarry longer. Dummy. You could do more if you went ahead and got filled. 
Jesus, didn't, Jesus only told them to tarry. The reason he said to tarry was the Holy Spirit hadn't been given in his dispensation when he said that. They had to wait. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they heard a sound of a mighty rushing wind. It came into the upper room, filled all the upper room where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as the fire sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Glory to God. What happened? The tarrying was over. He was here. I said he was here. Somebody say glory. glory. No need to tarry like that. What do you do now that you're filled? You can, you can wait on God. To tarry means to wait. Remember what Jesus said? You know, he said uh, over at Acts, I, hold your place right here. I'm not done. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And when being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye've heard of me. Amen. See, he, what Terry means to wait. They told them to go wait until they get the power. Then he said, and you'll be witnesses unto me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. What does it mean? Waiting's over. Go do something. And if you waited on God after that, it was to wait on God for more instruction, but it wasn't to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> so, we have traditions that rob people of the blessings that they need. I remember I was, um, I was at a camp meeting back in 19... Down at the Falcons Children's Home, it was, in, it was either in the fall of 79 or the spring of 80. And they, they, they had the uh, conference, the Eastern Carrot Conference of the, P, the PH Church down there at the Falcon Children's Home. And um, we went down there to, to, to hear. And Ray Hughes at that time was a general overseer of the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. Pentecost, they were Pentecostal Church of God. You know, there's three. But that was the, you know, the one out of Cleveland, Tennessee. <clears throat> and he was preaching. And all of a sudden, the power of God fell in that building. And he just stopped and said, it's a divine interruption. See, you can't just keep doing all i got to finish my sermon. You know, God wouldn't interrupt himself. Yes, he would. If, what, if God wouldn't need to do something right then that was supernatural or in a different vein than you preaching, he'll just shut you up and go around and do what he needs to do. I mean, the place came unglued right in the middle of a sermon. Power of God flowing on. I mean, the power of God. Hallelujah. And he had enough sense to recognize that God was going, just took off and went a different direction. So he just shut up and let God. <laughs> Amen. Well, see, he had preached under the anointing up until that point. Now, if he had kept going and shut it down, he would have he got out of the anointing. And people would have missed what they needed. That's why we can't just follow our traditions. And so here this ruler of the synagogue was so caught up in his traditions that this woman comes in, she gets healed, and get, he gets mad at Jesus because she got healed. And Jesus didn't have a whole lot of nice things to say to him. See, we all, oh, he, I, you know, we always have to say, I love you and God loves you and be blessed. Jesus said, you hypocrite, and rebuked him in front of the whole assembly. You'll take your donkey and you'll take your ox to get water, and you, you care more about them than you do this woman getting ministered to tonight. And, and she's a, got a covenant right to it. You should have been telling her all along, she's got a covenant right to it, and God wants her well. <coughs> Amen. <clears throat> and so when he said these things, all of his adversaries were shamed. And all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. See, you know, it's amazing how, much, how often the laity will rejoice when the ministers are ticked off. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So we have here, this woman had a covenant right to health and wholeness. And so just based on the right by the covenant. So see, church, here's the thing. Believers, when we've we got believers in the building, they should just know that they have a right to help and hold us. It's their covenant right. They, it belongs to them. You don't have to go find, you don't have to go for it. It belongs to us. Jehovah Rapha is our covenant God. Now, remember, we've, we've done studies on the name Jehovah. And, of course, in your Bible, you know, and just for those who are watching, uh, maybe not have ever heard us teach along this line, the word Jehovah comes from the four transliteral letters. That means we took, Greek, we took Hebrew letters and used the English, what we consider the English equivalent to it, so it became a transliteration of YHWH. Okay? 
And so, because the Jews don't have a, the Hebrew doesn't have a J. And so when the Germans came, they took that in, in, in 12th century, somewhere around there, they took the YHWH and then took the consonants and took the J, the Y made it a J, H, W, H, and then put in, and of course in the German, the, the V and the W are backwards from ours. You know, it's a Volkswagen, not a Volkswagen, it's a Volkswagen. Okay. And they put vowels in there, an E, an O, and an A, and it created the word Jehovah. Okay. Now you'll have people modern and in, in more modern times around the, around the seventies or eighties, we started getting more people using the term Yahweh. It comes from the same four letters. They just put vowels in the Y H W H and we get Yahweh. Now in your Bible, when you see the, the word Lord and what they call small caps, okay, they're all capitals, but they're not standard caps, they're small caps. So they're still capital letters, but they're smaller. That is so you can denote where the four letters Y-H-W-H are used throughout your Old Testament particularly, okay? And so <clears throat> this Y-H-W-H was Jehovah or Yahweh, meaning, now it meant the covenant-keeping God. Schofield in his Bible has some really good notes on this particular word of Jehovah. And, and then the compound names of Jehovah, Jehovah the Sidkenu, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah uh, Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, uh, these, different, these different names. And he said each compound covenant name. So remember the, the covenant name is, I am the God who keepeth covenant. God is our covenant keeping God. God declared himself the God that keeps covenant. He keeps his covenant. Somebody can say glory. And then Schofield goes on to say, say that the compound names, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Tzidkenu, um, Jehovah uh, Kadesh, are an increasing self-revelation of who God is. Now notice because they're compound names, they are, they are prefaced by the fact that I keep the covenant. Then he added in a self-revelation throughout the scriptures what part of the covenant he keeps. He said in one place, I am the Lord, I believe Jehovah the Sidkenu, I am the Lord your righteousness. Jehovah Shalom, I am the God of covenant who gives you peace. He said, Jehovah Jireh, I'm the God of the covenant who gives you prosperity. Jehovah Rapha, I am the God who keeps covenant and keeps the covenant of health and healing towards you. So when Jesus said, ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham who is in covenant relationship with Jehovah Rapha, be loosed on the Sabbath day, whom Satan bound 18 years, be loosed on the Sabbath day. She had a covenant right to it. God says, I'm the Lord that keeps covenant even to a thousand generations. He doesn't break covenant. Now, the New Testament says of, the, uh, of re referencing the new covenant versus the old covenant, we have a new covenant established upon better promises. But the Lord says, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus said in his ministry, I only do those things which I see my father do. What does the Bible say about Jesus' ministry? He went round about the villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness among the people. Amen. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. God hadn't changed. We look through the scripture and we see in the new covenant, the God who would heal under the old covenant is the God that's healing under the new covenant. We see that Jesus is ministering to people who are bound by the devil and even said this woman was bound by the devil. Boy, she'd been in most of our churches today. They say people going around saying, you know, uh, I'm telling you, God's got something on her trying to teach her a lesson. You know I'm talking to the truth. You've heard people say it. People have written books about it. They've done series on the radio. They'll get out and have scripture wars and fight over it. They'll fight to be sick. And then run to the doctor and pay him thousands of dollars to get rid of what God put on them. And I say that sarcastically. I don't know why the Lord put this on me. And then you run over to the doctor. You better stop going to that doctor. 
If you believe God put it on you, you better lay down and say, Lord, give me more. Teach me what it is I need to learn. Instead of running to the doctor to get rid of what God put on you. Say, I don't believe God put it on you. But people say that and then run to the doctor to try to get rid of it. If you honestly believe God put it on you, why are you resisting what God's doing in your life? <clears throat> that went over big. How big did that go over? Real big. Uh, I, I heard people on the, on the internet running around the room saying, yeah, that's right. I'm going I'm to stop going. No, you're not. You're going to keep going that doctor fighting it every step of the way. They do. See, it's hypocritical to say that you believe God put it on you and then try to get rid of it. Amen. Now, Jesus said this woman had a covenant right to it. It was her right to receive her health and healing. Should have been healed 17 years, 364 days earlier. Because the rule of the synagogue should have been teaching that she had a covenant right to it. Jesus ministered to her, her based on her covenant right. Now, we come back over here, and then we got another story, Matthew chapter 15. Hallelujah, starting in verse 21, Matthew 15. Hallelujah. As we said, verse 21. Help me get out of Matthew 21 and get back over to Matthew 15. Then Jesus departed and uh, uh, went thence and departed out of the coast, uh, I'm sorry, into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan. Now notice that the Bible was specific. Remember when he went to the minister to the woman in the synagogue, she, he called her a daughter of, Can of Abraham. Here it says, this woman came out of Canaan, out of, the, uh, out of the same coast, and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. He answered her not a word. And disciples and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. And he said unto her, I am, and he, and he turned and said, he just said this to his disciples, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She's not a covenant partner. She's not in covenant. She's a Canaanite. She's outside the covenant. Then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, but he answered and said, it's not right or meat to take the children's bread and give it to the dog, cast it to the dogs. Well, I'll tell you what. If people ministered like that today, they'd take them out of town and tar and feather them. Can you imagine what would happen if somebody came into this church and, and they came and said, I need help, and I said, it's not right to take with the children's, take the children's bed and give it to a dog, what would happen? The news crews would be here tomorrow. They'd go out and tell everybody they have the papers out here doing, uh, you know, doing articles on the, the pastor who calls people dogs. Come on now. See, we get this idea of, you know, what was he doing? He had the locator. She's out, it's already told us, it's already been established that she's outside the covenant. Under the, old, under, the, under the old covenant, she's outside of that covenant. And she said, truth, Lord, I'm a dog. Rough, rough. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's tables. And Jesus said, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole that very hour. What happened? See, under the first case, the woman had a covenant right to it. And he, could, he just ministered simply on the basis of the covenant. With this woman, she was outside that covenant and had, and, and had to get in her into the position of faith. She said, yeah, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be a dog if I can get my daughter well. Roof, roof. And then he said to her, your, your faith is great. So she, she, she apprehended that by faith in the fact that she, she recognized who he was, she recognized his authority, and received health and healing for her daughter outside of the, of the old covenant. Hallelujah. Well, people don't get healed unless they're saved. Is that what the Bible says? Go study your Bible a little bit better. He said for us to go out there and lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Didn't say the saved sick. He said the sick. Mark Brzee, I've heard Mark Brzee say this, and he may have heard it from somewhere else, but I know I, I heard him say it. He said healing is God's dinner bell. 
Do you know, go back and study your, your church history. You'll find out that the, the, the masses of people that got saved during the healing revival because people were getting healed. I mean, whole families were coming to churches because somebody got healed in their family supernaturally by, by the ministry of that healing evangelist. They leave town and churches would have increased in numbers just because people were getting ministered to. Then they'd get saved. It's amazing what, God, what the touch of God will do in a person's life. You know, and um, you think about the people that we talked about the prayer calls in recent times. Well, they didn't come to our church. Yeah, but they're in church. They're going, they're, they're going somewhere and getting ministered to. They got, we, we can't get caught up with why they're in our church. Be nice. We just got to keep doing what God has for us to do. Amen. Trust in him to bring people in so we can keep and continue doing what he called us to do and reach more people. Amen. There's people to touch, people, lives to change. But here in this particular case, Jesus had to locate it. So he says, You're, and I can't take the children's bread and give it to a dog. She said, all I need is a crumb. I don't even need the whole, I don't even need the whole piece of bread. Just give me, let a crumb fall down here. And the interesting thing is, I, you know, we got a beagle. And we've trained her. If she comes to the table and makes noise, she doesn't get anything. She whimpers. She acts doggish, you know. Barking or howling about food being on the table, she don't get anything. Get spanked and run out of the room. She'll come in there, and, you know. She'll walk past your leg just enough so she barely brushes it. She lets you know she's there, and then she'll sit down and she'll watch everything you do for the whole meal. If your hand, she'll watch your hand, mouth, hand, mouth, hand, mouth, and when she knows you're done, she goes around to the next person. Now I could be sitting there eating like this, buy a piece of bread, have a little piece of bread in my hand, and just kind of flip it like that. And I don't even have to look. I hear it. Huck. Well, she's on it. I mean, she's all over it like ugly on a monkey. And you hear green on grass, white on rice. I'm telling you, she's all over it. And this woman said, all I need is a crumb. Just let the crumb fall. I'll, I'll. And Jesus said, your faith is great. And because of that, be it according to your faith. And she got her daughter well. So we have one based on total covenant right, another based on accepting by faith what the master said. I mean, willing just to go whatever you had to go to become, become uh, the person he, he would minister to. And you understand what I'm saying? Within per godly parameters. He said, I, the, the dogs get the crumbs. She could have got mad. How dare he call me a dog? Who does he think he is calling me a dog? I don't need him. <clears throat> Pastors, you know, have to come and prove people sometimes. Who does he think he is? Trying to help you. Amen. Trying to keep you out of trouble. Trying to get you, you know, where you can walk in the blessings. Amen. Isn't that right? Jesus, took, Jesus got real hard with that woman as, as far as most people would say, but he knew exactly what he was doing. He was bringing her to the place of faith because she wasn't going to receive based on a covenant, right? She was going to receive outside that covenant by the, by, by the power of faith. And she laid hold of it and got it. I said she laid hold of it and got it. So you didn't have a right to the covenant unless you were a natural born Jew or you had converted through a process to Judaism. Hello? See, now we just get, we can get born again and get right into our covenant. And you don't have to go through a whole process. Just come in and get saved. So it's easier to get into the covenant under the new. He's, walking, he's broken down the wall of partition between the Jew and the Greek. And made of those twain one new man. Glory to God. But under the old covenant, man, it, you, know, you, could, you could have faith in him. But not, be Judy, but, but not have a covenant right because that was of the natural lineage of Abraham. The primary participants in it were the natural, those of the natural lineage of Abraham. Amen. So the woman being a daughter of Abraham had the, had, had the right to it. And let me say this, really even without faith, she had a right to it. It belonged to her. 
And Jesus operated and ministered to her on that basis. Then this other woman came. She's outside of that. She didn't have a natural right to it. And so he had to get her to the place where he could minister to her on the basis of faith. Now here's a new covenant thing. We got both the right to it and we have faith to receive it. God's dealt to every man the measure of faith. Praise God. So we got the double whammy on getting it. Hallelujah. Amen. I said amen. We can receive by faith based on a covenant right. We got, pre we got preachers who, and, and theologians who spend all their time trying to talk us out of what we can't have that God promised we could have. Well, just tell them their PhD means post hole digger and go ahead and get it anyway. Brother Shambach used to say, I got my BA and my BHG. I'm born again and baptized in the Holy Ghost. Yeah, somebody. <laughs> Amen. And he's got his DD, his devil destroyer. <laughs> Hallelujah. Her buddy Harris would say one time that, that Brother Shambach was the greatest preacher of faith he ever heard. He could preach you in the faith faster than anybody he ever heard. Not, not teach. Brother Shambach wasn't a teacher. He was a preacher. But he could preach you in the faith. I said, yeah, I've, I've heard him do it too. Glory to God. Amen. And so we as believers can, can enter into this covenant knowing that Jesus represented the Father. Jesus, in his ministry of representing the Father, revealed that God is still the Jehovah Rapha to this new covenant bunch. Amen. The, the apostle Peter wrote to the church in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, that he who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. Now somebody comes along and says, well, that means, you know, the spiritual disease of sin. That's not what Matthew 8, 16 said. So when Eden was come, they brought him those who were possessed with devils, vexed with devils, and those that were sick. And he healed the sick and cast out the devils with his word that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken in the prophet Isaiah himself took our infirmities and carried our diseases, or sicknesses and carried our diseases. Amen. I got it. By. Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. <clears throat> so 1 Peter 2, 24 can't be talking about sin. How do you know? Because the first part of the verse dealt with the sin. Whose own self bear our, sick, our sin in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. Yes. If you study 1 Peter 2 24, Matthew 8 16, 17, Isaiah chapter 53, I mean, uh, 53, 4, 4, 5, and 6, 3, 4, and 5, it's talking about sicknesses. The Hebrew word meant that in, in, in Isaiah. It's translated so in Matthew and in Peter. Amen. We got a covenant right to health. Glory. I said glory. It belongs to us. Somebody say it belongs to me. Amen. 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 Well, praise God. Anybody need to first lay hands on you? This is our, our communion and healing night. You need hand ministry by the laying on of hands for anything in your body. Anybody here? Uh, praise the Lord. Glory to God. No? All right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Why don't you just stretch your hands out it this way? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're going we're to lay hands on these handkerchiefs. Praise God, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the healing anointing. We thank you that that anointing is transferable. We speak over these prayer claws that if they're taken to people, that cancers are healed, that, that diseases are healed, that, um, that, that AIDS is healed, whatever, whatever, whatever the disease is that's taken and put on their bodies, the healing anointing will flow out of these claws and into their bodies and drive out the sickness and disease. Any spirits of infirmity would have to leave and they'll be made every whit whole in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We speak it, we decree it, we say it. So, oh, hallelujah. 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 We thank you, Father, for this anointing being a manifestation. We thank you. We thank you for the supernatural healings and the reports. Hallelujah. Glory to be to God forever. Glory be to God forever. We rejoice. Hallelujah. And the testimonies and the glorifying of the healer, the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. Glory to God. We say amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God.